We are going to start at the anointed and appointed time <laughs> of 11.15. But I got a lot to cover. I only have an hour. I would love it if we closed the space a bit. So if you are sitting in the fridges, you could just, just join us. Fill in this space. Let's be... <laughs> Black plus one white person together. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. How many of you know at least one other person in this room? If you don't know any other person in this room, raise your hand. All right. Can somebody who is not raising their hand introduce themselves, please? All right, here we go. Hey, everybody, I'm Shanae Jackson Kendall. Shanae Jackson Kendall. You now know Shanae Jackson Kendall. Would anybody else like to introduce themselves? Hello, everyone. I'm Plush Bunny of the Naughty House. Now you know Plush Bunny of the Naughty House. Hey, gang, gang. Anybody else that would like to? Yes. My name's Kevin Patterson. Kevin Patterson. Now you know Kevin Patterson. So you know at least three other people in the room, <laughs> right? That's the foundation of building community. All right, let's go. So, as I said, you can go to bit.ly slash love with a capital L, abundance with a capital A, 2023. Or you can scan this QR code let me know what you see when it comes up. Oh, wow. First page. So now you have it on your phones. You don't have to keep looking over there. All right? And there are going to be some links and stuff that you'll be able to click and get more information. Why do I do this? Accessibility. Follow along with me. All right? So on your thing, all you got to do is tap it. I should move to the next slide or you swipe it out, that works. Mm -hmm. All right, before we get into the topic, the rise of polyamory among African Americans, I will introduce myself. Is there anyone in this room who has absolutely no idea who I am? Okay, you lied, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Feminista Jones. Um, I'm a writer, I'm an activist, I am a doctoral candidate, I'm a public speaker, and I love talking about black people and sexuality and fucking and loving and all the things that we're not supposed to do according to hundreds of years that told us we were not allowed to do that. So that's what I do. I'm talking about polyamory. Who has no idea what polyamory is? Look, I am in the right room. Yeah. <laughs> now, we've heard of it. We may think we know what it is. Sometimes it's different ideas of what polyamory is. I've come to learn over the last couple of years, poly is whatever the hell you want to make it. <laughs> Words don't mean things anymore. <laughs> so, what the words say? Polyamory is the practice of engaging in multiple romantic and typically sexual relationships with the consent of all people involved. Polyamory is a form of ethical non-monogamy. What is ethical non-monogamy? I do not have to read all of these things. They are on your devices. You can check it out later. But you do have things like polygamy, swinging, people being monogamous, people being open, people being polyamorous. There's a number of things, and in my research, I am introducing a term multi-dating. I'm going to put that under the e and um, umbrella. That's what point of research is, and doing those things. Okay, ethical non-monogamy. Basically, I can be involved with different people on a sexual and or romantic level, and I can do so with other people being well aware that I am doing this. I am not sneaking around. Everyone is aware. Everyone consents to being involved with me, knowing that I am doing this, and I am moving ethically. 
I could teach a 45 minute lecture and workshop on what it means to operate ethically and make it a five part series <laughs> and still not get to what it means to live ethically because everyone in the audience will have a different idea. Right? All right. So there's different types of relationships. This is not the end all be all. We've got hierarchical primary partners. We've got anchor partners. We've got triads, quads, etc. We've got polyfidelity, where people live together and they're only with their group. We've got solo polyamory. Can't nobody agree on what the hell that means. <laughs> We've got relationship anarchy. We've got the V's, the C's, the W's, the whole alphabet, right? We've got polygamy, polyandry and whatever else people want to make happen. I had to throw that in because I'm still, I'm trying to figure it out. But that's why we got to study this because it's growing and people are trying to build the plane as they're flying it. Even though the plane company has been around for hundreds of years. <laughs> build a new plane. You got some different approaches, right? You've got kitchen table or garden party, and you all don't agree on that either. You've got more communal vibes. You know, you've got some uh, nation building, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, don't laugh at nation building. Huh? Oh, we gonna get there. You got nothing me rock, and then we got a Q&A. I'm gonna zip through, because I ain't got, they ain't give me much time. You know, black people talk about Tori, love to too. <laughs> you got parallel. You got don't ask, don't tell, right? You got, again, you got the relationship art anarchy, and then do what you like, because why not? Well, they say, you turn polyamory into a verb. Poly your <laughs> way, right? Whatever. You can look on your devices, you'll see some examples of different types of configurations. This is not exhaustive. This is just stuff I had to put in my paper because this is an academic endeavor, and you have to assume that people that are reading what you are writing have no idea what you're talking about, right? Okay. So, so, what is the current research on, you know, African Americans and polyamory? That's it. That's it. And what do I mean by research? I mean things that are published in academic journals, things that are kind of enter, have entered into the academy, or what have you. We've got all the news articles and magazine articles and online articles and YouTube videos and all those kinds of things, but none of these are based on any kind of studies that have been so-called validated by the institutions. Now, we know that because of social media, we have moved into a public sphere where knowledge is being created in public spaces. And we cannot invalidate that knowledge, right? Because not everybody has access to the academy, right, or to the institutions. However, in order to fold what we do into these conversations, we have to have more of us putting it into the academy, right? This is what I found after doing damn near an exhaustive search Articles written since the year 2000, published in peer review and open source journals, there were like, not throwing off the number or whatever, there were about 487 written about ethical non-monogamy or polyamory versus like 2,400 written about monogamy with those words. And of the 400 and change that were written about uh, polyamory or ethical non-monogamy, these are the only ones that focus on black people, right? So we've got Open to Love, Polyamory and the Black American by Christopher Smith. We've got The Who and Why of Consensual Non-Monogamy Among African Americans, Noel St. Bill and others, Attitudes Towards and Willingness to Engage in Consensual Non-Monogamy Among African Americans Who Never Engaged in CNM. Again, Noel St. Bill, she is one of the leading people that is actually doing this. Um, and then there's a couple of videos that I used that were like, experts or what have you, uh, what can you learn from, what can you learn from this polyamorous relationship? Nothing. Um, <laughs> and our poly relationship is not ungodly. And then I have Love and Abundance Mind, which I am working on getting published now. Hopefully we'll get that in the academy. 
back with uh, coming soon. <laughs> All right. So I did this um, as an independent study research project at Temple University, where I am a PhD candidate. I am a PhD candidate in the Afri African American Studies and Africology department, but I'm also having a, have a certification in gender, sexuality, and women's studies. This was sponsored by gender, sexuality, and women's studies, right? Um, and my advisor is Dr. Jennifer Pollitt. If you've never heard of her, she is a leading um, scholar in kink, BDSM, polyamory. Um, she's white. She's cool. <laughs> she was like, yeah, yeah, this is brilliant. Yes, yes. Like, she loves everything I do. It's great. She's a very big supporter of me and my work. Okay. So, why did I have to do it with that? I'll, I'll you know, explain a bit of that, right? All right. Before we get into that, we have a problem in Africana studies, black studies. Well, we don't talk about sexuality outside of trauma and pathologizing. If you were here last year and you were at my Afrocentricity um, session, I got into that a bit more. Africana studies don't do sexuality. Gender and sexuality don't do African Americans. <laughs> right? So wherever are you reading stuff? It's housed in maybe queer studies. It's housed in American studies. Um, maybe even history, sexuality studies, etc. When you see people publishing, they're publishing in the Journal of Black Sexuality, Journal of Bisexuality, things like that. This is not going into the Journal of Black Studies. I'm not even going to send it, and I know the editor. <laughs> they're not going to publish this, right? So if I want it published, I've got to go through like women's studies or gender studies and things like that. They're thirsty for it because you know ain't nothing like a white feminist want to prove she got black friends. So <laughs> they're, they're going to be like, give me, give me. So, you know, I gotta polish it up a little bit. I need to do ain't a little too many times. <laughs> so what did I do? So I was researching the current state of polyamory more broadly. Um, I was re researching representations of open relations in the media. So I was looking at things like um, big love and how, how, how they put plural love into the media. Um, I presented the rationale for the study and the implications for Africology and um, gender, sexuality, and women's studies. And in 2023, we still have to pull both of them in and say you have to talk about love mm -hmm. that black people have. They're, they're, and it is intentional that we, they do not talk about black people loving unless they were loving whiteness, right? So we have to push for that. We have to encourage our younger scholars to talk about love. Black people know how to love things that are not named Jesus. Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I also looked in to because I was a nigga. I looked into um, alternative. I looked into alternative pieces of knowledge because, as I said earlier, there is this stuff being done. You got people like a Kevin Patterson. You got people like a Shanae uh, Jackson Kendall. You've got people that are out here creating educational spaces and writing books and talking about these things but they are not necessarily being recognized for the scholarly work that they are doing Amen. because they are not affiliated with institutions, right? So, you know, I cite them in my work yes. because I have an entry into the academy and we have to bring that in there, okay? So I was looking at that. Most of the sources, there is gonna be a sources link in your document. You're gonna see a lot of them are not academic sources, right? Doesn't make them any less valid. And I interview five people. And so it may not seem like a lot, but qualitative interviews for something like this, to talk to five people, and you'll see the diversity of their stuff, is really, really important, right? Because I'm like the third person to capture black people talking about polyamory for the academy. Mm. It's 2023. I'm like, what? Your grandfather was popular. <laughs> <laughs> Your funeral was five families. <laughs> 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 Shit. <laughs> oh, your grandmother. She knew. <laughs> so why am I focusing on polyamory and discussing this with I'm always thinking about sexual justice and black power. Okay? 
it's growing in popularity, yet we don't have much information that focuses on African Americans. We are trying to disrupt sexism and patriarchy within our movements. All of this is social justice, all of this is liberation. But until we start talking about love and sex and things like that, we're not really gonna move beyond those boundaries, those restrictions of patriarchy and sexism. Um, there's a lot of erasure of queer people and what I have learned in my time of studying is that within polyamory among African Americans, there are a lot of queer identifying individuals and their stories are being lost. We have to capture those. Um, we're confronting racism and confronting racism is sexual liberation work. Sexual liberation work is rooted in bodily autonomy and for black people to assert bodily autonomy is revolutionary, okay? I'm looking at, I'm asking questions like how can polyamory possibly liberate the black people who embrace it? What does that look like? Is this a revolutionary type of love? Is this a liberating type of love? And then I need, I want to expand these disciplines by researching underrepresented people. So in Africology, queer people are severely underrepresented, polyamorous people are underrepresented, and in sexuality and women's studies, black people are underrepresented, okay? All right, so when you are coming from an Afrocentric perspective, which I am. Um, I remember we always start in Africa. We always start in the beginning. And so the, in the beginning there was Ma'at. Who's ever heard of Ma'at? Okay, great, go look up Ma'at. I don't have a lot of time. Um, Ma'at Ma was the goddess of truth and harmony and justice and balance and order. Excuse me. <clears throat> we did not have the restrictions of gender and sexuality that we have today. Everything you know about gender and sexuality comes from white people. Every way you label yourself, lesbian, homosexual, transgender, polyamorous, it's all coming from white people. They came up with those terms. They came up with those definitions. We use that, that is because that a language that we have. We are speaking English, we have you know, derivations from Latin and things like that. But if you spoke another language, you wouldn't be using those words, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you spoke another colonizer's language. Mm -hmm. So our understandings of these things, our understandings of how to love and what it means to be a certain gender comes from them. If we are going back to the source, we can't do that. So in my last class last year, I talked about the need, the need for new terms. We need new terms and new definitions, right? The ancients understood how procreation worked, but families weren't defined by what we understand now as a nuclear structure. Every term, one of you niggas talks about the nuclear family <laughs> is the key to our liberation and making the black family stronger and the community stronger. I want to throw you out the house like Uncle Phil did jazz. What you talking about? It is one of the most destructive things to ever happen to Africa. Woo! We cannot survive as nuclear families. We did not survive for millennia before contacting Europeans by having nuclear families. That is not how this works. Polygamy and polyandry did exist. It existed. We have examples in West Africa, in East Africa, in Southern Africa, okay? It was not always financially viable for everyone. You ain't have enough goats to afford that lady, because you had seven ladies already. <laughs> her dad was like, well, if you can't give me seven goats just to take her on, how you want? That's not going to work. But they tried. Communities work together to raise their children, support each other, form kinship bonds beyond blood relations. And we lived by this idea that I am because we are. And so, when we think about that, I think we can conceptualize it, right? Like community being together and things like that. We can see ourselves having multiple friends and family and we're loving our family members and our siblings and the three that we didn't know about till last year. And we love them. <laughs> and we have our friends and, and we love them and we love them in different ways or whatever, but we stop at the idea of loving multiple romantic partners. Exactly. Why? Jesus. <laughs> we have to think about the impact of colonization whenever we discuss black love and black sexuality. 
The disruption of our families and communities happen. The imposition of Eurocentric ideas, right? Things like patriarchy and sexism. Homophobia began to spread. Homophobia is not African. Don't, don't let nobody tell you otherwise. It is an imposition on every non-white culture, okay? We have religious ideals were imposed, enslavement, the dislocation, the removal of us from our mother home and sprinkling us in different places. What that does, it disorients you, and we have been disoriented for centuries. And it led to the rejection of sexual pleasure and fear of bodily autonomy, all right? So in my research, I was like, yes, I could talk about the rise of polyamory, but I, I got to understand why, there, why I'm observing a rise, right? That's usually how science looks. You, you notice some things, and you're like, well, why is this happening? And I want to study that, right? Um, and I talk a bit in the study about my own you know, identifications and things like that, but I was just like, it's actually the full thing is um, the rise among millennia, right? I didn't want to study Gen X. I didn't want to study us Gen X people. I wanted to study millennials because I feel like they are kind of at this, like, they cover so much right now. Like, they cover an older group that my group can relate to, and they cover a younger group that, like, my son's group, you know, can relate to. They're kind of in this middle space. Um, but that's who also I'm noticing it among, too, right? So I started participating in these groups and stuff. I was like, oh, there's thousands of people in this, these groups saying that they are polyamorous. 87% are not what they're saying. <laughs> they are. <laughs> they're saying they are. And I want to know why. Because to say that out loud, even on Facebook, even on Instagram, that's still a taboo thing. Especially on Facebook, your grandmother's looking like, well, why are you post up with two men? <laughs> So Barbara King, 2017, she said we're having a cultural moment. What she said is like a reckoning of sorts during which more people are interrogating their adherence to monogamy and shifting how they think about dating and relationships. And you will notice that there's been more articles and things about polyamory in recent years. More people are talking about this, right? Four to five percent of the adult population in the United States participates in ethical or consensual non-monogamous relationships. Four to five percent. That is a lot. Right? You think it don't sound like a lot, but in a heteronormative, mononormative, religious, sexist, patriarchal, racist, classist, ableist society, fat phobic society, four to five percent of what, 375 million? Mm. That's a lot of people. And half of them in Atlanta. <laughs> 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 People in ethically non-monogamous relationships continue to face stigmatization based on the taboo nature of their chosen lifestyles or love styles. People have reported employment discrimination, familial and social ostracization once it is revealed that they engage in non-monogamous relationship dynamics. So that's just a reminder to let you know that this is still a fringe, marginalized identity. For you to say, I am polyamorous, you are subjecting yourself to possible discrimination, discrimination, um, discrimination and, and being ostracized from your community. And for those who value community, as we inherently do as African people, that's a hard thing to do. So what do a lot of us end up doing? Kind of live in the closet, right? And we try to we extend grace to those people, right? If you know that telling your family that you're polyamorous means you're not going to get invited to Thanksgiving dinner, how are you going to get your grandmama's greens? Three <laughs> <laughs> partners, greens. Three <laughs> partners, <laughs> greens. <laughs> greens. <laughs> greens. <laughs> greens. <laughs> greens. <laughs> you make a tough decision. Make a tough decision. Because she might not be here next year. <laughs> I searched, you know, uh, peer reviewed. Oh, there go the numbers. There was 488 things written about polyamory. Um, most of those were focused. Well, a lot of those were focused on pathology, violence, and the connection between polyamory and BDSM. Right? 
Comparatively, a search for monogamy with the same parameters produced 2,597 documents. So everybody wants to talk about monogamy, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, how do I reach these people? You can read that, I don't have to read the whole thing, but that's the message that I sent out to everyone. Um, and I specifically said this isn't for people who identify as ethically non-monogamous broadly, or people who are swingers or in open relationships. There's a difference, right? I wanted people who self-identified as polyamorous, but I was gonna ask them what they thought it meant, right? And I got different answers. So y'all yeah, just fucking. <laughs> you can go to the next page. You'll see the questions that I actually asked people, so you'll see what was there. And then with every question, if there was follow-up, you know, I indicated that in my discussion that I probed a little bit deeper if they said something that I was like a little more interested in, but everybody got these same um, questions, right? So who did I have? I had a 41-year-old African-American cisgender heterosexual man from Atlanta, <laughs> of course. He's married to a cisgender woman, father of four. He identifies as both ethically non-monogamous and polyamorous. I had a 33-year-old African-American cisgender pansexual woman who lives both in Los Angeles and in Mar Maryland. She is married to a cisgender man. She identifies as a relationship anarchist. I had a 33-year-old African-American cisgender heterosexual man who lives in Florida. He identifies as solo poly. He lives with two of his cisgender queer female partners in a nested triad. So he identifies as solo poly, and he lives in a nested triad. <laughs> I don't get to talk about the research, I just present the data as it comes. No shade, no tea. So much shade. 38-year-old African-American cisgender queer woman, lives both in Hawaii and Maryland. She's single, she lives alone. A 27-year-old African-American heterosexual cisgender woman who lives in Dallas, Texas. She lives with one cisgender male partner and she has another boyfriend. So those were the five people that I talked to. Um, some of the interesting things that they came, that they said that came out of their research, and these, again, these are qualitative interviews. I uh, interviewed people via Zoom, recorded, transcribed, et cetera. Cleaned up, you know, some of the stuff in the, you know, grammatical stuff, you know, whatever. They said, one person said, it's the freedom to love how I desire to love and when I desire to, to go, and move when I desire to go. Um, somebody said men are not as comfortable with their female partners having other male partners but will support the women dating other women. This came up a number of times with folks. We're still dealing with what we call OPP, one penis policy, um, even when folks say they're okay with it. Something happens when it actually happens and women seem to lose value, you know. Um, one of the gentlemen said there's still competition between men for women's attention. Um, it's still prevalent in polyamorous communities, even though his understanding was that that wasn't going to be a thing, because we can all have a piece of her. So why are we competing? I was like, that's deep. <laughs> uh, somebody said, I had to unpack my marriage. I had to unpack what I think about relationships. I had to unpack my fear about being open about my sexuality, and to unpack my fear about being judged. That is a huge thing for African-American folks are like, we don't want to be judged. We judge by enough. We already live in a racist society where they make us, you know, their own assumptions about us based on how we look. We don't want to add another thing. And I find that that also came up in terms of activism too. There is a lot of polyamory activism out there, but you do not really see our faces. It's like white people are doing it, right? And there's a maybe a bit of privilege in that, you know? that you can go ahead and do this. Yes, same thing with uh, same-sex marriage, you know, yeah. stuff like that. Same thing with uh, interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. Had to be a white man and a black woman. They would not allow the black man and white woman to make it to the Supreme Court, right? So there's this kind of understanding that maybe the white people gotta do it. Because if we put ourselves in this, we're opening ourselves to more stuff. Um, polyamory expanded her capacity for love and her circle of people whom she loves, not just romantically, but also in platonic connections as well. That is something that came up with some other people, that polyamory has taught them how to love their friends better and how to build better platonic relationships because of this idea of embracing honesty, truth, transparency, all those kinds of things. It becomes applicable in all of their relationships, therefore making all of their relationships better. Right. Um, polyamory has made me assess and reassess on a constant basis how I feel about certain things. 
I was never necessarily the toxic misogynistic guy, but I also had a lot of thoughts that most men, especially since I grew up in the hood, have when it comes to how you look at relationships and you look at women. Mm -hmm. So you have a man saying that polyamory has helped him change the way he thinks about women, and maybe even how he treats women, mm -hmm. right? Um, another person said he's grown, he's grown in, um, his understanding of queerness and transgender identity because of his exposure to diverse people and polyamorous communities that he's involved in. So you come into the online communities, the in-person communities, and you're meeting people and you probably wouldn't have met before. You're meeting trans people, you're meeting queer people, you're listening, you're learning, and you're getting, you know, you're hearing more about their experiences. Um, somebody said, I've always been polyamorous. I just didn't know that there were other people that were polyamorous and I didn't know that there was a word for it. So we see that a lot when like new people kind of come into these community spaces that we've been in for a while and they're just like, I've always felt this way, but I didn't have the language for it and I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. What other group has felt like that, right? So there is somewhat of a coming out of process being polyamorous, right? Um, Diverse representation would reduce some of the stigma associated with being polyamorous, even among polyamorous people. So polyamorous people sometimes can have some of their own narrow ideas about what it means to be poly, and this person was saying that if we had more diverse representation, not just a big love situation, a man with multiple women, not just a man trying to nation build with three women, not just you know those kinds of situations, everything it seems to come up like Triads are the only way to go, close triads, or one of the women has to be bisexual. You know, people are saying we want to see more diverse representation, and you can find some of that in some online communities and places like this, but it does tend to be centering around cisgender heterosexual men and the women that they're with. And there's nothing wrong with being in a polycule or dynamic where it is a man and multiple women, if you are opting into that with a free mind and a free spirit, this is what you want to do. However, if you want some other pipe, <laughs> and you say to your man, well, since you gonna be with Lisa on Thursday, Jaheen said I can go. It's <laughs> a so third Thursdays. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Go on. Okay. He will break the phone talk for me. Can I do that? He's like, no. Just saying. Maybe you're not as happy in your situation as you think you are. I'm not judging. Do you? All right, so I do list the sources there, whatever, and then I have some Q&A or whatever, but there's a couple of things that I wanted to um, just say, because I got time. You don't yeah. 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 Um, No, I get to give you my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so to sum up the research, <laughs> there is definitely an increase in um, African Americans identifying as polyamorous, um, and then for every one that we see, there are more that we don't, right? So if we're looking at where I'm in a group and it's you know 700 people, and let's assume everybody there is legitimately body <laughs> amorous. Um, imagine there's four more for each person, mm -hmm. right? If we're kind of looking at like queerness and we were trying to like you know we're looking at those things, well, we get about a quarter of people who identify as a thing willing to say that they identify as a thing. So we can kind of ballpark that, right? Okay. There's a lot of us. And a lot of us are not living ethically or consensually. And so what liberation looks like to me is helping people identify if this is a way that you want to be, what is it limiting you from being that way? So we don't do research just for research's sake. We do it because we want to take it and use it as a way to help liberate our people. So if I can do research that I'm finding that people are saying that I want to tell the world that I'm polyamorous but I can't because of X, Y, and Z, so then my next step is like, all right, so how do we get rid of X, Y, and Z? Mm -hmm. Because maybe there's other people who are not saying this because of that. So we're looking at barriers. We're looking at systemic issues. We're looking at what do we need to dismantle so that people can live freely. That's how I'm thinking about this research. Okay, so what are some of the limitations of this? 
I put the call out online across my social media, so that's a limitation. I didn't put up signs and places, so there's probably a lot of people that I missed or what have you. Um, I had 17 people respond to my inquiry, but was only able to schedule interviews with five people. People are, you know, things come up, people get nervous, they don't wanna, whatever the reason is. So it's difficult to get people that wanna talk about this. I'm happy to continue to expand this if you ever wanna be interviewed by me. I'm happy to talk to you about that, you know, about this stuff. And I can just always fold it in and add more to my day. Um, I don't think a lot of the people who identify as polyamorous actually are polyamorous. And the reason why I say that is because I'm not sure that enough of us know what love really is mm -hmm. to be able to love ourselves first, then another person, and then multiple people. And I'm saying this as African American because of my understanding of the destruction that has happened as a result of colonization. I see you saying you love multiple people, but I see how you show up in the world and there's evidence that you haven't quite come to love yourself yet. And I'm just one of those people, tired, um, who is looking like, baby, we gotta start there, right? But it's a starting point. Right? It's a starting point. It's conversation. Well, my research makes me question why people do this. Right? <clears throat> Is it just men who just want a bunch of women? Right? Were they reformed cheaters? One of my participators, you know, one of my participants came through um, polyamory through cheat. Well, actually, both. Two of them. One came because they were a cheater before, and they were like, "This is not cool." And somebody introduced them to it. And so, kind of like a reformed cheater, I do think that that can happen. Because if you don't know, you don't know what you don't know. If you don't know that you actually can live a life where you can be with multiple people at one time and not hurt anybody, if you don't know that you can do that, you're going to do what you see everybody else doing. Yep. What you see on the TV, on the Lifetime movies, you're going to cheat, right? Mm -hmm. Then the other person said is because they were cheated on and it forced them to kind of look at why they were upset about what their partner was doing mm. and kind of deconstruct that. Mm. They didn't stay with the partner, Ashe. Mm -hmm. You don't stay with a liar and a cheater, ever. Mm. But it, it, it cost them, it, it, it got them to think about why was I upset about this? That they were having sex with somebody else? That they were building a relationship with somebody else? Why was I bothered? Because I didn't even know it was happening because this person was still taking care of my needs mm -hmm. and what I wanted. So why did I feel the way? So I love that, right? I love that self-interrogation. So there's a bunch of things that are coming out of here. Um, we do see that there's a lot of gendered stuff. I have posited, if you've been in groups with me before, I have said that I see way more women identify as solo poly than I see men. And my theory is that there is a respectability that is offered to people that claim to be polyamorous, as opposed to being swingers or in open relationships or things like that. Even though polyamory is still fringe within ethical non-monogamy, polyamory seems to carry this respectable kind of ideal, right? Because it's not just about sex, it's love. <laughs> it's love. Love is better than just sex. <laughs> on Mondays. <laughs> so I find that women who want to date multiple people without aspirations of marriage or cohabitation or having children are going to identify as solo poly. But a lot of them still want to find that man to settle down with. So this is right now. So what do we call those people? Multi-daters! Um, presented by Michelle Benay White. <laughs> <laughs> Soon to be doctor. I am entering this and defining this, and I'm going to enter this into the lexicon. We have to leave room for the people who want to date multiple people, not in secret. I'm open. I Maybe I'm looking for something serious. Maybe I'm not. I can go out with people, I can have sex with multiple people, I can love some, I don't have to love some, and eventually if I want to get married, I do. So the solo poly people, they don't be identifying like that. 
They said, I don't want to live with nobody. I don't want to get married. I don't want to have, you ain't getting my money. You know? But what if you're somebody who maybe that's okay and I maybe want to do that one day, but right now, you know, I'm for the streets. <laughs> but you can't say you for the streets because of the stigma that comes with that, right. even within the polyamorous community. Some of y'all know we just had a conversation about it. Mm. Do you think that people are in the streets or for the streets if they flirt with too many people? People are like, are you polyamorous or not? Yeah, you polyamorous, but why you got to throw your dick for everybody? Because <laughs> you polyamorous, you do what you want to do, right? There was a tension there. People were kind of like, well, are we not poly? Do we not get to do whatever? And other people are like, yeah, we're poly, but there might be some guidelines and some restrictions, or maybe I'm looking for this, and I don't want somebody who makes me the 17th Wednesday women crush. <laughs> you know, maybe I don't want to be number 17. Because <laughs> right now, it looks like you was just scrolling through the friends list, the members list, and you was like, her, her, her. Like, you know, what does that mean, right? So does polyamory mean that you're, it's a free-for-all? No. no. We are having these conversations, and we are having them amongst ourselves. And we often see that when black folks are going into other spaces with people who are not black, conversations look a little different, right? You're like nine of them in a two-bedroom apartment with four dogs. Oh. And you're like, wow, that's how the other side lives. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> I'm going to go back to my black hole. <laughs> because while they're messy, they ain't doing that. <laughs> right. I love that this is happening, though. I love that people are building that community and connecting. I love that we are having these conversations. I love that we can have conferences like this where I can get a room full of people to come and listen to me talk about this because we have to continue this. This is real. It's like, it's acknowledging, right? So in, in Africology, we talk a lot about this, the idea of nomo and this idea of naming. If you don't name something, it doesn't exist in African culture. Right? That's why our naming ceremonies are so important. And things. You have to give a name to something in order for it to exist and to be real. And so I'm saying, like, I'm naming that there is this increase and this rise and that more of us are seeking something other than what we've been told is right the right way to love, the right way to live, the right way to have sex, the right way to connect. We're saying, maybe there's other ways. But the other limitation, again, I said, is we are using language and ideas created by people who are not us, and we can't discuss love and relationships and sexuality among African American peoples or among African peoples around the world without our own cultural understandings of these things. And we have to acknowledge that that has been disjointed and broken due to colonization, which is why within our poly spaces, we still continue to have a lot of issues because a lot of us are adhering to very sexist, oppressive, racist, mm. classist, ableist, fat phobic ideas about love and relationships and sex, right? So this is ongoing research. I'm going to continue to do this because when I'm done, I ain't gonna have no job. And so <laughs> we just gotta keep writing, I guess. That's what you do. You write, you teach, whatever. We'll keep doing this and hopefully be one of those people, you know, that inspires other people to come and research and things like that. And the final thing that I'll say about that is that um, I use the Afrocentric method and the Afrocentric method rejects the idea that science is objective. There is no objectivity in science. The Afrocentric method honors the subjective. It very focuses a lot on ethnographic stuff, talking to the people in the community. We also like to do our research as members of the community. So because I am a polyamorous person, I am researching polyamorous people. I am within that community. Um, we believe in letting people tell their truths and their stories. So it is a lot of interviewing. It is a lot of just kind of, here's what the person said. Mm -hmm. But you can't, as a researcher and a scientist, offer context and have a, a robust analysis if you are not connected to that community. See, white people observe. You know, that's where you get racist ass anthropology. They're just looking at people and making their own decisions about what they think they see. Whereas an Afrocologist is observing and experiencing and allowing the people to say exactly what they're experiencing, okay? I just want to say that. Questions? Somebody had a question. Uh, kitchen table, Polly. Yeah, so kitchen table, garden poly. Is this idea that 
you're involved with somebody, they're involved with somebody else, you'd be comfortable getting together for a meal or coming to a conference like this and all y'all sitting together or, you know, that kind of thing. Garden party is kind of like, you may not all sit here, one could sit in the back there, but you're comfortable with the person being in the room. You don't necessarily have to talk to them much, but it's not like, you're not going to be a bitch, right? Ain't no beef. Ain't no beef. Ain't no beef. Ain't no beef. It's like, I know, I know what he does too. I felt it. <laughs> Table poly too, different levels. It's it's really you gotta talk to the people that you're dating and see what they're comfortable with. Because some people are more comfortable with other things that they're not. You have a lot of people when I say parallels, like people are like I just want my relationship to be with you. I don't need any interactions with your your other partners. You know, maybe in the case of and even with that, you know, some people are more strictly parallel. You get in a car accident, I'm not calling your other partner. Your mom might have to tell them. Versus. <laughs> Yeah, Did they not say that? <coughs> y'all was there, y'all like, saw him up at the same time. wasn't going to tell the woman that the man was in a car accident. That's a real example. That's a real example. Because mama will tell him. Versus, oh my God, we're in a car accident. The first person I'm going to call is this other person's car accident. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, relationship anarchists, y'all just walk around. <laughs> Lover, friend, sister, lover. Now you're my lover today. Tomorrow you're my friend. <laughs> you know. Embrace fluidity. Embrace fluidity. It's whatever. You're my friend now. You're my lover tonight. I'm free. You know. God, I love it. I love. I love. It. I think that's actually really great. Um, yes. I think they have their hands up here. Okay. Sorry. Uh, my question was about like a hierarchy. Yeah. Um, is is it like okay to be in a polyamorous relationship and like put, you know, a hierarchy on who's, like you know who's gonna be here for forever? Yeah. Who might be there as like somebody you wanna have kids with later? Gotcha. Who's gotcha. Be with as, like, so the question later? is, is it okay to have hierarchy in your relationships? Absolutely. Yeah. Very simple answer. <laughs> right. Right. You do what you want. <laughs> your way. Now, the question but, I'm going to have to challenge you with that is, yeah. is it successful? Well, I mean, but then you also have to define what success looks like, right? And so this idea, you know, is it okay? You said something about, you know, this person's going to be here forever. Nobody's going to be here forever. Mm -hmm. So let go of that. And polyamory helps you learn that too, right? Yeah. But there's no forever guarantee in your relationship. When you say people say breaking up and divorce isn't an option. It is always an option. Hell yeah. Especially if you don't like how the other bitch act. This is always an option to leave this situation, you know? I'm not going to leave. Well, you, one of your boundaries is if you're, my partner impregnates somebody else, I'm not going to be around. So how are you going to say you're never going to leave? Because right. now they've impregnated somebody else, you got to figure out what you're going to do, right? When you say leaving is not an option, you end up compromising on this thing that is very real for you, right? So we don't want to do that. But there, I, mean, I hate to have to say this, but most Polyamorous relationships are hierarchical. Uh, yeah. That's, and especially among African Americans, because we're still figuring this out. We're still like, wait, this is okay? I'm, I'm allowed to do this? Well, wait, wait, let me, let me make sure my man is okay. Make sure my husband is all right. Then you sure? So I'm about to go out. <laughs> Car is cooling up. Face is beat. I'm going. You sure you're all right? I'm gonna go. <laughs> right. And you come back in. You use it. Two hours and 45 minutes. I, I, I'm back. You good? <laughs> yeah, I'm good, man. You sure? Yeah. So what y'all do? So they did You know, it happens. We're still like working that out. But I do think what you see, and I'm going to say this, I'll put it out there, you can challenge me if you want, go do the research and challenge me, and then you come back. Yeah. That the average situation among African Americans is a cisgender heterosexual man yep. who is involved with more than one woman, mm -hmm. 
at least one of those women may identify as queer, right? They don't always have interactions with each other, but they quote unquote share him. That's the average. That's, I should say, the median. Mean, whatever the hell, you mathematicians, whatever one means the most likely that you're gonna see, <laughs> that one. That is what we still see. This is still a love style that favors cisgender heterosexual men. Why? Because it also leans into the scarcity mindset that African American women have internalized that one, they are not desirable, two, it's hard to find someone on their level, three, et cetera, et cetera. You know, black women have this scarcity mindset. So as old you get, more willing you are to take a piece of a man, right? I'm not, I'm not lying, right? So this is something that comes up in an observation and research. It's like, yeah, I've been monogamous, but that hasn't worked out. I'm 43, can't really find much. I'll take a piece of this man because the piece that I get is working for me, gives me what I need. It's okay that he's with somebody else. And we live in a society that encourages that. Right, encourages women to exist for the pleasure and satisfaction of men. So we see that play out in polyamorous communities as well. The next you're going to see is a man who wants his two queens. And they need to be bisexual, and they need to have threesomes with him, and they need to not get too close with each other, but they should be able to coexist with each other and that kind of thing. A um, lot of hierarchy. And I know this because I asked a question in a group as to whether or not married people would be willing to divorce their spouses to create mm -hmm. equity and to eliminate some of that hierarchy, and they were looking at me like I asked them the worst question in the world. So you said you ain't hierarchical, but you're not willing to get a divorce and remove that legal hierarchy that your spouse has to make things a little more equitable. Mm. That's okay, just stop saying you're not hired. Hello. Okay? Your car breaks down, who's the first person you call it? That's hierarchy. You know who to go to, right? Are you calling the person in LA that you see once a season for a weekend at a hotel? Or are you calling the person who washes your streaky drops? <laughs> Multi-dating, yes, I did that. So, <laughs> but I'll do it again, I'll do it very succinctly. It's the idea, I think, that there are people who are dating the way we normally see dating, but we are secretive about it. So we'll go out with Tyrone on Monday, we'll go out with Jennifer on Wednesday, but we won't tell them that that's what we're doing. Jennifer called on Monday, hey, what you doing tonight? Oh, I'm gonna be watering my house plants. No, you're going out with Tyrone. You should be able to communicate to Jennifer, I have a date or I'm spending time with someone else, right? And I think that there are people that want to live like that. Like, I'm just kind of in this dating stage and I'm just spending time with different people. I'm living my best life. I'm going to brunch on Sundays and I'm traveling to Ibiza and I won't, you know, I'm not necessarily at that place where I'm really thinking that I need to have these serious romantic relationships that would qualify me being polyamorous, but I'm also not trying to be secretive and kind of hide and juggle all these people that don't know each other. I guess my follow-up question would be, are you using it to frame a transitional phase that people are in or just naming? No, I'm just naming that these people okay. exist. Okay. That this, this approach to ethical non-monogamy exists. Okay. And I think it gets lost. And I think that's why people say I'm solo poly. But I think that that's not what solo poly means, right? Um, so I think that there's something else that isn't solo poly, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, they were first. Okay. Can y'all help me out? I'm gonna just go this way. We got some time. I'm the last one before lunch. We got time. Okay. So. Multi but oh, give me the first two layers. Do you have uh, friends that are non polyamorous that you have like really intimate you know, relationships with? You have friends yes. that aren't poly yes. that I have intimate relationships with? That's most of my friends. Okay. Do, are 
are you at the point of giving advice to your friend when they're like, you know, either they're married or in committed monogamous relationships, but you know, we get the, the tea about wanting to be double penetrated or other things that their partner we know would not approve of, but like, Oh, am I giving them advice? Yeah. So you you want you want the triple hole special, yeah. and <laughs> still can't talk to you. this home girl about it. But you can probably come and talk to me because I'm the triple hole queen. So I'm just like, <laughs> how do you, uh, how do you um, without like prescribing them or telling them what to do yeah. or telling them to cheat or anything yeah, like yeah, that? With, and then yeah, I don't give people. I don't give people dating. You ain't gonna listen to it. <laughs> Stop giving your friends relationship advice. They don't listen to it. So, no, I don't. I don't do that. And I don't. I'm trying to think of how many married friends I don't. We don't do marriage. <laughs> <laughs> what I would do is, yeah. 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 I do have. I do. I do have some friends. They they are married. They've been married since college, though. We're in our forties. I don't know if they really count. Mm -hmm. And they come to my kinky events, so they are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're good. Yeah, I don't know. Let's go around and say this question. I was thinking about, so you brought up the concept of scarcity. Yes. And I was thinking about it probably from capitalistic terms, if I'm yes. being honest. But when you mentioned earlier that if you can't afford the seventh mm -hmm. wife, mm -hmm. then you don't get the seventh mm -hmm. wife. Or if you can't afford the third girlfriend, mm -hmm. you don't get the third girlfriend. How does, how does economics play into Ooh. 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 That's our favorite topic. <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 you can't talk about it every without talking about it. I'm gonna be brief because that is a very loaded, I can do a whole session on that, it's very loaded yeah. thing. You have, um, right. <laughs> you have to think about how capitalism plays a role in your love life. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's to varying degrees, you know, for for all of us. You know, some people. I'm I'm personally a person. I feel like if I am financially struggling, like I can barely make it check to check, I can barely keep a roof over my head. I'm not focusing on romantic relationships and dating. I'm focusing on taking the extra time and energy to try to get myself out of that. And it doesn't mean that I don't deserve love. It just means that right now this is not a priority for me. I have to get my life together. Whereas other people may feel the best way for me to get my life together is to have that love and support in my life. And maybe we don't get to go on these trips or do any kind of elaborate dates, but we're here for each other, things like that. And then someone else will come and say, well, if you're not doing stuff together and spending time together, how are you in a relationship? And then somebody else will come and say, well, I only see my partner twice a year and we're still in a relationship. And then somebody else will come and say, well, I don't know if seeing your partner twice a year at the hotels for a weekend and makes up a relationship. And somebody else will say, that's why your man fucked me last night. <laughs> the conversation, right? <laughs> so, econo economics is a factor, right? A lot of people, for the, for the kind of example that I have, a lot of people are struggling, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is income insecurity. There's all kinds of stuff. We know that black folks have disproportionate, you know, classism issues and stuff like that. A lot of people come together in polyamory because they want to pool their resources. Mm -hmm. And y'all joke about them, but I'm telling you that is actually the original way of being. So I know we joke about nation builders because they wear natural deodorant and they chew on things that <laughs> When they say grand rising, I know, I know it's trouble. But they are people too. And, and some of what they are onto is a good thing. If it's, you know, if it is actually egalitarian, and if, like, I don't see a problem with four or five people coming together and saying we want to build a community that we can sustain for ourselves and for our children. And some of us are loving each other and some of us like each other and some of us are having sex with each other, whatever. We're all coming together, all agreeing to do this. That is the African way. Yeah. So, you know, we could joke a little tee tee whatever because some of them are foolish, but there's nothing actually wrong with that idea, right? So we can do that, right? We just, Set them a subscription of degree. <laughs> <laughs> no shade, no tea. Some people are allergic. I get it. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs>
Um, what, was, what was the rest of the question there? Capitalism, yeah. Some of y'all too poor to be polyamorous, and that's real. Like, let's... You, you can't afford yourself, right? And that's okay, like, I'm not shaming, I'm just saying you can't afford yourself. You haven't had a locker twist in seven months. <laughs> I'm not shading you. But it costs money to live in America. It costs money to be black in America. It costs more to be poor than it does to be rich. You are paying a premium for being poor. So you can barely do that, and all I'm asking is, how then are you able to pour into others in a way that we may classify as being in a romantic relationship? And I think it comes down to that too, like what does that mean to be in a romantic relationship? And everybody kind of looks at those things differently too. So it really comes on you. But I do think that there are some people who cannot necessarily afford the lifestyle that they are living. Yeah. Yeah that other people may be subsidizing for them to be able to live that, right? That's what I'm really talking about. I'm not saying if you're poor, you don't deserve love. Of course you do. But when you rely on other people to subsidize your life, and that's why you collect in multiple people, so you always have a place to stay, then perhaps this isn't what you should be doing right now. And then there are some, I'm gonna call it out, there are people who will look at other people and be like, you can't afford to be polyamorous with me. You got a wife, you got a girlfriend, you're barely making it with them, how are you gonna add me? I'm good. I'm one of those people. Because, <laughs> clearly, I cost a lot. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Poor dick is great. <laughs> So I am a I am a therapist who yes. somehow got selected to work with couples who are poly. Oh, wow. And so I'm working with a couple who identify one identify as kitchen poly mm -hmm. and the other identify as hierarchical. Mm -hmm. Right? Two You can both be true. Right. Mm -hmm. But the they, situation wait, they're together? They're they're married. Yeah, so this married couple, one they're person married. identifies as kitchen table, one identifies as hierarchical, and I said that both can be true. Right. They can exist in the same space. Yeah. The issue that we're running to is economical reasons. Economical that she has multiple partners, he doesn't, uh -huh. but he feels like, you know, well, I'm going to be, I want to be the hierarchical person because she's going to need me financially, so I need to stay here. Um, Versus she is like, you know, I'm just using you because, you know, we've been together so long, but I have these other partners that are supporting me financially. So, wait, wait, wait. wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, is, okay, so no, no, you know, this sounds like something that came up, right? Yeah. There was a question about, um, you know, the dynamics between men and women. Men are expected to be the providers in relationships. So if a man has multiple women, he's likely paying for the dates and mm -hmm. things like that. But as a woman, if she's got multiple men, she's probably never paying for anything or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I was telling people, you gotta let that gender binary nonsense go and you know share the responsibilities. But people are like, oh, I, I'm not a man if I don't pay for it. Okay, well then you go and be broke then because you're, you're, you know, you're not trying to get this woman to pay her share. like. You know, whatever. So that sometimes will come up and that can create issues of envy and jealousy, two different things. Um, people, there's an insecurity, a man can feel insecure if his, he can't take his wife to Ibiza, but this year alone she's been to Curacao and Ibiza and all these other places, courtesy of these other men. It can make him start to feel away, you know, stuff like that. Um, and you can see the, you know, in reverse, kind of like when um, a woman is like, she gets a birthday gift but then the gifts that he's given to his other partners seem to be bigger, more extravagant, he spent more money or whatever, and then he's like, well, I see you all the time, I get you gifts all the time, I only give them gifts on the birthday, you know, whatever, because those kinds of things will come up as well. Um, I don't think that the KTP and the hierarchy are at odds, but I'm trying to understand, is it, is it him wanting to be the top man for her? Yes. And she's married to him. Yes. He already is the top man. He doesn't feel that way. And she doesn't make him feel that way. She doesn't make him feel that way. Right. And so my so question, why is he staying with her? And that's my yeah. question. My question to you, 
is do you have resources so I can help them see, because I can't give them the answers, but I have to guide them to the answers so they can see themselves. Right, talk to Kevin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she put you on blast. Talk to Shanae. You can talk to Shanae. Shanae's here. You can talk to You're Kevin. You're a therapist and you can't tell them the answers, but I'm a coach and I can. So. <laughs> right. No, and that's real. Like, that is real. There's a difference between coaching and therapy. You have certain guidelines you have to live by. If I were in your position, and I have been, I would suggest that they um, kind of reassess their relationship and why they're together. Um, I would point out that they seem to be uneven, um, and I would ask them how long do they think they can sustain an uneven relationship before it falls apart. Um, I'm not sure the polyamory is the issue, so there may be, like you brought up you know, money and stuff, so there may be some other stuff that's going on. And more often than not, when folks are seeking therapeutic support in polyamorous kinds of situations, it's not polyamory that is the issue. It's usually whatever issue is happening between them as a as a pair, okay? Yes? To piggyback off of that, because um, I'm, I'm in a similar rela similar situation, um, but we're new to now what I'm understanding is more ethical non-monogamy than it is polyamory. Mm -hmm. So I am more of the style of like kitchen table, yeah. whereas my male partner is more of the style of hierarchical. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that. My question is, how do you navigate the what I'm seeing as the insecurity, mm -hmm. despite all efforts being made for them to be secure as the top hierarchical person? So I want to reiterate that hierarchy is not opposite of KTP, that you can be hierarchical and you can be kitchen table poly. Kitchen table poly is simply the idea of being Everybody. comfortable around your partner's partner. Gotcha. Okay. Um, you're saying that he's more hierarchical in the sense that he wants to be your main dude and he doesn't want you loving anybody else. So yeah, so he wants you, me to be the main and he wants me to be his main and him to be my main. Mm -hmm. But that when, I, when it comes to other partners, it appears that he's more insecure about A, how many other partners I have. Yeah. Also very much um, not okay with it being another male partner yet. Mm -hmm. It can only be a female partner, like those kinds of things. So yeah, so I don't. That's not insecurity. That's patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. not, okay. You know, you're not describing insecurity. You're describing patriarchy. And so he's navigating in the only way he really knows how. Right. So you're saying this is new. So right. he's only very new for both of us. A trying lot to navigate. of men start out that way, and then they grow into other stuff. Some don't, but. A lot of men, I bet you ask a lot of men now who have multiple partners or their, you know, their female partners have multiple partners, if they were like that in the beginning, they were like, oh, I wasn't always like this. So sometimes it's evolution because that is decolonization that has to happen. Yeah, There's right. a deprogramming that has to happen. And we all go through it, right? So you're saying that you're, you're newer to it. Yeah. It may take some time to do that. In terms of the insecurity, I don't think any insecurities can flourish in any kind of relationship, right? So that's more of an issue of you kind of talking with each other and kind of calling and naming out what those insecurities are because a lot of time the insecurities have to do with fear. So yeah. it's not necessarily an insecurity, it's a fear of loss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's fearing that he's going to lose you right. if you are allowed to see other men. He's fine with the women because women don't pose a threat. Right. But if you see other men, you might find a man that you think is better than him. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's a fear of loss there. So you gotta be able to name that and confront that. Okay. And sometimes partners need reassurance. Like I don't like when people say, well, you probably should be fine. No, sometimes people need reassurance. Yeah. yeah. That you love them and that, you know, you wanna do this and it's new, but you know, it's no threat to what we have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, those are the kinds of things that you can do. But sometimes it is a threat. Yeah. Sometimes you do meet somebody who changes your whole perspective on things and makes you look at the relationship that you're already in and be like, maybe this ain't it. Mm -hmm. That's okay too. There's a fluidity in polyamory. People learn a lot about ending relationships, right? Because a lot of times we end relationships and it's just devastation. It's relationship and devastation healing next relationship. Whereas a lot of times when you're a polyamorous and you're dealing with multiple people, that can happen overlap. Mm -hmm. And so you're starting somebody with new, something new with somebody and then a month later you ending something with somebody else 
And you're like, how do I do this? How do I navigate this? I've never had to do this before. So there's a lot that you learn about the fluidity of relationships. Um, it's great. It's, it's, it's open. And, and the final thing that I will say before they kick us out of this room, unless there's one more question, is that <laughs> everything you think you knew about how relationships work and function is up for challenge, yeah. engaging yeah. in this particular love style and this particular approach to you know, dating and relationships and sex and things like that. And that's okay, allow yourself to be challenged. Allow yourself to be open to things that you never thought that you want to do, right? Because whatever, and I named, the, I titled this Love in Abundance because at the end of the day, don't nobody need more love than black people. Right. Come on. Like, don't nobody need and deserve and is worthy of more love than black people. So if there's a way for some of us to increase the abundance of the love that we have in our lives, we can do it. Let's just try to do it in ways that let go and release all that toxic shit that we've been programmed to believe about ourselves and things like that. Let's find a new way. Okay, last question and then we're gonna go. Not a question, I just wanted to piggyback on what you're saying. You mentioned the insecurity and the fear of losing and how that, that could happen. It may be yeah. a threat, but that's not just the polyamory. No, that's you can a have that same fear yeah. of loss in a monogamous yeah. relationship. That's the same. Yeah, it's, it's fear of loss. Yeah. And, yeah. and that gets multiplied in polyamory because you're dealing with multiple people like some people come to polyamory and think that they take a patchwork style well i'm going to date these five people because together they make the ideal person that i want right whereas other people are like no every person that i'm with should be somebody i'd be willing to be with just by them right you know so then some people are in the middle and somebody's like my main is 80 percent of what i want my side this other lady that i'm with she gives me like 40%, but that 40% captures the 20% that my main don't have, so that's why I fuss with it, right? Mm -hmm. And then now I've got everything that I want between these two people. Mm -hmm. Some people do take that approach. If it works for them, it works for them. Sometimes it can be problematic, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to, to think about that as well and how all these things show up in multiples, mm -hmm. okay? So there's multiple instances of COVID. There's multiple STD outbreaks. There's multiple children. There's multiple job loss. There's multiple sick parents. There's multiple you know, things that are going on that you've got to show up for all these different people because it's a loving relationship. But what we find is that more, I'm not gonna say more often than not, but a lot of times, people have disconnected relationships outside of their primary. Mm -hmm. So they'll do all that with their primary, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the people that they see less frequently don't necessarily get that part of them. Mm -hmm. And then there are the people who say they prefer long distance relationships in part because when I see you, it's gonna be a good time. Mm -hmm. And I don't have to deal with the in-between stuff. Mm -hmm. That stuff somebody else can handle. I just want the good times. I want the best of you that you're gonna give me for these four days and three nights. Yeah. And I'll come back again in a few months and we'll do it again. I'm not mad at that. If that's what works for you, that's how you wanna live. But that's what I'm saying. Everybody gonna poly day way. I hate poly used as a verb. I really do. <laughs> this is the Atlanta people that started doing that. Right? <laughs> I came straight out of Atlanta, didn't I? <laughs> no, but you know, so that's that's cool. So this is ongoing. I encourage everybody to continue to research and to read and to contribute and to talk to the people that are kind of some of our experts and whatever. Not everybody's perfect. Challenge them. Ask your questions. A lot of your questions make us think about things that maybe we hadn't thought about before, new areas of research and things like that. I will continue to expand on this. I thank you all for being here thank today. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.